context for the whole meeting. Uh, I'd like to also add a welcome from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I work. You may know it mostly for the um, Mars Rover missions, the Cassini mission to Saturn, and of course the historic Voyager missions. But there is also astronomy at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, such as the Spitzer Space Telescope that last year concluded a successful 16-year mission, and the original camera and the repair for the Hubble Space Telescope, which you can see back over my shoulder. If you haven't heard already, Hubble, after a month of downtime, is now back to regular scientific operations, which is great news. I also want to say hello on behalf of the um, uh, 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 Exoplanet Exploration Program Office at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I work. Um, that is a, a, a office that is uh, working for NASA headquarters uh, on the subject of implementing NASA's goals for um, exoplanet studies, uh, both for supporting current missions and for future missions. Uh, let's see if I can get my um, slideshow to, to fill up the screen. Okay, hopefully you're seeing that. Minimize this. And let's get rid of the chat. All right, so my overview of my talk is I want to say a few words about why we're doing a workshop on disks and young planets right now. Some more word from our sponsors. I'll give you an idea of what we know so far about circumstellar disks and young planets, at least in terms of raw numbers. Uh, and then I'll go through the agenda for the workshop day by day, um, highlighting some key topics and some you know, really exciting results from the past few years that I think you should take notice of as the speakers bring them up. Also, because we have a, quite a few beginners, I think, uh, who, for whom this may be their first um, you know, exoplanet or disk conference, I'll highlight some points that you might, uh, beginners might want to be aware of, and then I'll give you some concluding thoughts. So uh, the reason that this is a good time for a workshop on this topic is there's just been so much amazing progress, new facilities and final data sets becoming available in the past five years. Foremost among these is ALMA and all the fantastic results that it's been obtaining. We've had surveys with ground-based adaptive optics discovering new examples of hot young planets. We've had the Kepler mission get its final data sets uh, processing done uh, to give us a real picture of the output of the planet formation process that we can now compare to models. Uh, and we have lots of interesting prospects for future work. So uh, this is really a, a, an active field and there's a lot to tell you uh, about what's happening. So in terms of a word from our sponsor, uh, the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program is led out of NASA headquarters, but at JPL there's an office with another 30 or so of us who are doing these various tasks shown on the screen here. You've already seen at the lower right that the um, NEXI uh, Exoplanet Science Institute, what it does in the presentation by Chaz. But in addition to that, the major effort of our office at JPL is technology development to try to enable future missions for direct detection and characterization of exoplanets, such as an Earth 2.0 around a nearby star. And that means suppressing the light of the central star so we can see that 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 times fainter object in reflected light. We also uh, support the community by providing opportunities for research along with Keck that Nexi operates. There's a new spectrograph present at, at the Wind Telescope uh, in Arizona for radio velocity precision measurements. We've just concluded a survey for exozodiacal dust with a telescope in Arizona. And we're supporting follow-up of the test mission uh, and Kepler and K2 with uh, deblending their stars. So this key sustaining research for the community is an important part of what we do. I think many of you have come across our communications resources. The Exoplanet Travel Bureau posters are very popular and are seen in astronomy departments worldwide. Uh, and now we have Halloween posters that are even new ones coming out this year. And another object of our um, activities at the JPL office is these mission concept studies uh, that we've done in the past and we've supported the ones for the decadal survey. All of us here in our office in the program are looking forward to finding out what the U.S. Decadal Survey on Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, directs the, uh, NASA and the NSF to do to support um, U.S. astronomy research in the 2020s. We should be seeing that report uh, at the end of August. If you want to uh, stay connected to exoplanet programs, first of all, you are a participant in NASA's exoplanet exploration by, uh, program by virtue of being uh, an attendee at this conference today. Uh, if you're interested to see more about what we're doing, you should visit our public website, our website for researchers indicated there, the NEXI website, of course, that you've already been to several times. And we have something called the Exoplanet Program Analysis Group, which includes um, uh, 
uh, groups that consider important issues as to the definition and future of NASA exoplanet activities. Uh, so if you go to that website for the ExoPag, you can find out how to subscribe to our mailing list. We'll send you a message, you know, a few times a month. All right, so let's talk about what is known already about circumstellar disks and young planets as sort of a starting point for all the research we're going to hear about this week. Uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope um, and its cousins, the Herschel and Wise telescopes, you know, far infrared space observatories, have been surveying uh, the sky in various areas to identify disks from infrared excess emission above a stellar photosphere. And when looking at nearby star forming regions, sort of from Orion at 400 parsecs and closer, these surveys had identified more than 6,500 young stars with disks or envelopes you know, in different stages of evolution. Uh, and, and so these are our sources where we can see the, the, the growth, formation, and evolution of a protoplanetary disk. Um, in addition, those missions surveyed nearby stars to look for excesses around them, uh, main sequence stars that, that are mature aged and that have debris disks around them. Uh, and so those um, uh, have been numbered now in, in the uh, nearly 100 uh, being detected. Uh, these pointed observatories, Spitzer and Herschel, didn't cover the whole sky, but the small WISE telescope did survey the entire sky and found warm debris disks all around uh, for a total of over 1,700 of these. So the bottom line message of this whole slide is we have a huge number of identified disks within uh, the nearby distance horizon that we can use as our targets for observational studies of planetary system evolution. There is no shortage of targets. The question is to how to prioritize which disks to study for what scientific questions. So um, now the other side of our workshop is how many young planets are known today. If you haven't been to visit it yet, I highly encourage you to visit the NASA Exoplanet Archive at the URL that's listed at the top of the screen there. Uh, the archive is a place that uh, keeps track of all the confirmed exoplanets in the published literature, uh, whether they're discovered by one technique or another. Uh, and it, when you go to the uh, new planetary systems table and select the default parameters, you can create a list of all the 4,400 planets that are known now and start to down select on it to identify the young planets yourself. So the default um, columns that you get don't necessarily show um, the young planets. You have to select the columns as I'm showing here, uh, add stellar age as a, a column that you want to see displayed, get rid of some other columns you don't necessarily need and move things around a bit. But when you do that, you can create this kind of a table showing you the young planets that we know today. And I selected for ages less than 0.03 giga years or that's 30 million years. And you can see from these ages, which are very approximate, they're not quite as accurate as some of these error bars will lead you to believe. You'll hear from Lynn Illenbrand about that a little later today. Um, you can come out and see this is kind of what we know about very young planets, less than 30 million years. And when you see this, you can tell that imaging is a technique that's been very successful in identifying these young planets. Um, and there's a, a smaller number have been identified by radio velocity or by transit. Uh, but as you go to later ages, you see more and more of them. So let's go into the details of these numbers. Uh, so if you look at now all the, the masses that are known, uh, which can be up to you know, 20 and 30 Jupiter mass estimates for some of them, uh, as a function of age, imaging has gotten up to 30 uh, planets seen up to ages of 300 million years. And that's very unusual because imaging is not, it's a very minor technique for mature planets but for young planets, it's much, much more successful. Uh, for transits, um, that's the biggest um, detection method for mature planets, but it's not as successful for uh, young planets. And if you go out to a giga year, you're getting up to you know, dozens of transiting planets that have been found. Uh, transit timing, is, it's got one case, radio velocity, relatively small number of cases also. So this is very different uh, from what you are, are used to seeing uh, on, on typical diagram plots. And a, a science highlight to point out here already is we've had the first discussion uh, and discovery of an exoplanet detected by the kinematics of the disk, the velocity perturbation in the orbital motion of gas in a disk, indicating the presence of a perturber, uh, which is inferred to be a very young massive planet. So this is the, the, uh, the table here showing uh, for um, objects that are not brown dwarfs, and that was the table for all planet masses. All right, so now the summary statistics is there's still only about 44 young planets that are found at less than 100 million year ages. 
So that's a pretty small number, about 1% of all the exoplanets that we know today. So we're talking about a small sample, but these are a very important sample because they preserve uh, more than any others the initial conditions of planet formation and give us a chance to learn something about what is, what is going on. Okay, so now let's um, talk about day by day what the workshop is gonna bring to us. The first day today is mostly about the population and properties of young stars. And of course, these are the stars around which we find uh, the protoplanetary disks and the young planets. We've got to understand where are we looking? We find these stars from the, the infrared surveys I mentioned or from their activity or their motion along with other known young stars. So this is just a tiny fraction of the stars in the galaxy and we classify them both by the properties of the star and by its environment. And the McGath, uh, Hillenbrand and Morath talks are gonna go into the details of how we get the properties of these stars and make estimates of their ages. Uh, a real highlight, uh, I think, for the past few years in uh, the area of properties of young stars and their populations has come from the ESA Gaia mission, which because it has reestablished the distances for all of our exoplanet hosts, young ones are old, it sort of revised the um, uh, sizes of transiting planets and it's revised the temperature conditions because of the luminosities of the stars have been updated. And in the case of young stellar associations that Jonathan Gagne will be talking about, Guy has, been, Guy has been able to find new examples of stars co-moving with known young stars, therefore indicating that those new ones are young as well. So it's expanding our understanding of which stars are members of these young associations. So on Tuesday, uh, the main topic is the properties of circumstellar disks. And of course, these are the builders of worlds. They create the planetary systems that uh, host the life in the universe. So they're very important to understand uh, what is happening in them and what's happening observationally. Um, so initially, of course, disks are accreting material from them onto their central star. Um, and that's not a planet formation process, but it certainly affects what's happening. You need to be aware of it. Joan Jita will talk about that. And then um, the dust in the protoplanetary disk undergoes grain growth into larger bodies called planetesimals, and then they manage somehow through processes that we're still understanding to grow into planets. So uh, that is a, a topic of Miriam Benisti's talk, the initial stages of, of grain growth. And then we also are bringing in today the topic of debris disks, which are sort of the disks that are left over in planetary systems, not from the original formation, but that are created from the junk, the, 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 the planetesimals, the collisions, the cometary outgassing uh, that continues to happen in a pl mature planetary system and that can still tell us about its structure. So both kinds of disks have internal, internal structures like gaps, um, narrow rings, uh, asymmetries that can be um, driven by planetary perturbations. So the Bay and Wyatt talks will go through that. Um, and the real highlight for tomorrow, if you haven't been thoroughly exposed to it yet, uh, is everything that has been coming out of the ALMA Observatory. ALMA, I hope you you're know or, or will learn this week, is the penultimate disk observatory on the ground, uh, operating at millimeter wavelengths with 50 large antennas um, and it's the most competitive observatory in the world today with more than 1,700 proposals submitted last cycle. That's more than Hubble, that's more than JWST. And for our field, it's just been absolutely transformative to be able to see the structures of these disks at 0.2 arc second resolution, you know, five to 10 times better than we're used to having in the pre-ALMA era. So this is a uh, results from the D-Sharp project led by Sean Andrews at the, at the Harvard Smithsonian. And results of that project plus interesting ones since then are gonna be reviewed by Laura Perez and Karen Oberg, um, uh, what those ALMA surveys show for disk dust and for gas emission. And the um, uh, D-SHARP project itself is worth some of your attention if you haven't come across it yet. The December 2018 issue of, of Astrophysical Journal Letters had 10 papers on D-SHARP. And there were um, 1,100 citations for these papers in only the last 2.5 years. Usually your paper is doing pretty well if you get you know, uh, 20, 50 citations in the first year. This is a fantastic impact of these ALMA observations and ALMA is just the most tremendously exciting thing happening in disk research today. And this is a NASA person used to space missions telling you this. Um, so on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking about uh, planet formation uh, and uh, we have to use theory to understand what's going on inside the protoplanetary disk. And a kind of a miracle occurs in there. 
uh, like the story of Rumpelstiltskin, somehow we are spinning straw into gold inside of these uh, protoplanetary disks, the, the straw being the interstellar gas and dust, ordinary material. And outputting from this is the planetary systems that play host to life in the universe. And our theorists are playing the role of the Miller's daughter here and trying to understand and make this happen, uh, hopefully in the future without the help of Rumpelstiltskin or anybody else. Uh, it's a, pro a process where we have to go from very tiny dust grains in the interstellar medium uh, into planets that are 10 trillion times larger, a huge growth that will be discussed in the Isidoro talk for building um, uh, giant planets and terrestrial planets uh, will be also discussed in the Helid talk uh, and then the Nielsen talk about uh, the ways giant planets are formed. The Kepler mission has really helped constrain planet formation processes because it's given us the size distribution of planets, size frequency distribution, also their uh, orbital uh, frequency distribution, at least for short orbital periods, less than a few hundred days. Uh, and those will be discussed in B.J. Fulton's talk um, and in comparison to models by Christoph Mortesini and then Elaine Bedotto talking about uh, the, um, the erosion of atmospheres in the early stages. So this is a real re research highlight, I think, from the past five years is the results from Kepler, and now that we need to model them and fit them. The Thursday, the focus is on finding and characterizing young planets, uh, because that's the opportunity to really see how they're different from the mature planets that we see later. We know that they're very hot and easier to detect than subsequent planets that have cooled off. Uh, but the detections are complicated beyond imaging because the stars are much more variable at young ages. And so radio velocity and transits have a lot more noise to contend with. And we'll hear about that from the Arpita Roy and Mann talks. Um, so the facilities that we've been using for direct imaging are really amazing. Uh, and that have also really hit their stride in the past five years surveying young stars to uh, detect and place limits on the presence of planets. Um, and then um, the coronagraphs have been doing that. And Anne Marie Lagrange's talk, I especially recommend for talking about everything that has happened there and Andy Schemer about characterization. And another research highlight in this area from the past uh, five years is the VLT gravity interferometer originally constructed to really look at the galactic center and the black hole, the orbital motions of stars around that has been able to detect you know, young hot planets, measure their orbits with incredible precision. So I really recommend that you watch Matthias Nowak's talk about this. So finally, uh, on Friday, we're gonna hear about young planet evolution and uh, the future of the field. Um, and so um, you should understand that many groups uh, are trying to look now at the protoplanetary disks that ALMA has uh, been able to see interesting structures on and see if they can uh, directly observe the planets that are causing those structures, if that is in fact what is happening. Uh, and so also these early young planets are, are potentially enduring much harsher radiation environments than we have today, especially for uh, M-type stars, the red dwarfs have a lot of X-ray activity early in their age uh, and their lifetimes. And so this can erode the atmosphere severely, uh, potentially affect the habitability of M stars you know, that are at mature later ages. There may not be an atmosphere left potentially. So Evgenia Skolnik is gonna discuss that topic. So um, a really interesting result, uh, a highlight of the past five years is that we've seen the first examples of a, a, a planet within the cavity of a central protoplanetary disk uh, that we've been able to see that that planet itself has its own disk around it, a circumplanetary disk. And there's evidence for accretion from that circumplanetary disk onto the planet. So this is all very new in the past few years. The source PDS-70 uh, should be burned in your mind after Friday. And Kate Follett, uh, Follett will be discussing that. And then a um, lot of new and proposed facilities uh, are uh, in the works that are gonna produce interesting results for us, ranging from JWST imminently in Christine Chen's talk uh, to the uh, extremely large telescopes that are going to let us look closer into young stars than ever before and see planets more in the inner parts of the disk instead of the outer widely separated regions. We're going to also learn more about exoplanet demographics going from what Kepler showed us in the interior part of the disk, you know, to greater separations enabled by microlensing studies where the Roman Space Telescope will contribute there. Scott Gaddy will discuss it. And then a long-term goal for um, NASA elucidated by the 2010 decadal survey um, that I participated a lot in our office is interested in is the ability to see Earth analogs around nearby stars in the habitable zones. 
So Aki Robert is from Goddard and we'll talk about the mission concepts that will enable us to do that and improve our knowledge of transiting planets. In a few months, we'll know if any of those concepts are started. So the um, questions to ponder this week as I wrap up are, um, these are ones that occur to me. So um, I think the most valuable systems that we can find are the systems where we can localize where is a planet and where is a disk in the same system. Because then we can uh, test the models that you'll hear in talks this week about the interactions between uh, dynamical um, perturbations of planets and disks. Uh, and relatively few examples of these are known today. There are lots of radio velocity planets that have disks, but the disks are not precisely located because they aren't imaged. Uh, and then conversely, we have um, lots of disks, but we can't see the planets inside them in many cases. Like, uh, and so this is uh, the few examples where we can see both are really important. So keep your eye on those this week. The circumplanetary disks I just mentioned uh, with recent discoveries, they may be more observable than the protoplanet at their center itself is. So when we go looking for planets, um, we may find the circumplanetary disk itself. So how are we going to know uh, which source we are seeing? Of course, the circumplanetary disk leads eventually to the formation of a satellite system around a giant planet, as we have you know, for Jupiter and the outer planets. And then another question I'm pondering, not just this week, but kind of always, is there's just so much more that ALMA could do for young disks. There's a recent paper just came out um, by Ninka van der Merrill uh, and, and Heis Mulders, which discusses uh, more than 700 protoplanetary disks have already been measured with ALMA in the millimeter continuum. Um, so uh, do we keep going to measure more? Do we go back to the ones we've had to get even higher resolution data? You can get down to 20 milliarc second resolution with ALMA. And the few examples where that's been done are really interesting. Um, and then of course, there's so much chemistry uh, to study in the disks, you know, which species and so forth. So what to do with this fantastic tool of ALMA is a, as important a question for the future as you know, the upcoming facilities like JWST and the ELTs. So I hope you form your own opinion about that this week too. So I'd like to end and wish you all that you have fun, that this is informative for you and the early career people really take the time to um, ask questions because this meeting is intended to be for you. Uh, and I'm gonna end with a little um, uh, extra time to get us back on schedule and maybe uh, Lisa, you might uh, suggest we take some questions. Thanks. Yes, let's take a couple quick questions. Um, try to just take a couple minutes here. We stay mostly on time. But I've just been watching the Q&A, and I know some, some people have been jumping in and answering. Thank you so much, speakers, for doing that. But um, one question that's bubbled to the top and um, <clears throat> is about how do you, what is being used as a tracer for planet age? So how do you tell the age when you talk about young planets? How do you tell what that age is? And, and I want to fold into that another question that came up earlier, which is, can you explain more about a warm debris disk? And I, I, I raised that one at the same time because those two might kind of mesh together. So how about it, Carl? Right. OK, well, I'll do the debris disk one first because I am a bit more of a, a disk researcher than a star researcher. I made the distinction of warm debris disk because that's the, the kind of disk that the WISE All Sky Survey was sensitive to. Uh, its longest wavelength of survey was 22 microns. So it could only see dust that was within a couple AU of a solar luminosity star. Uh, so something like a Kuiper belt could have been missed by the WISE All Sky Survey. You need to go to longer wavelengths like 70 or 100 microns to pick up Kuiper belt kind of dust. And, and of course, the Herschel and Spitzer observatories did observe there, but they did not observe across the whole sky. They were pointed. Uh, observations. Uh, they didn't have the fields of view to, to survey the entire sky. So the warm disks, um, you're closer into the star, there's more radiative forces acting on the dust. They clear out more quickly. That's been shown through Spitzer uh, surveys. Uh, so the, they tend to be the younger debris disks. So to, to one indication that a source is young can be that it has 24 micron Spitzer or 22 micron wise excess. Of course, it could also be a re recent major smash up in the system to liberate a lot of dust in an otherwise old star. Um, in terms of the age diagnostics for stars, I think we're gonna hear about that in the other talks today, but you need to look at the um, activity uh, of the star uh, and the context of other stars that it is located within the same cluster or association. And, and so some stars can be age dated um, better than others. So uh, like, for example, if you have lithium in the atmosphere of the star, this is an element 
that in a convective star is circulated down deep into the star and fused uh, into um, heavier elements. So uh, lithium tends to disappear uh, in the atmosphere spectrum of an older star. And so you can age date the star a little bit by the presence of lithium. Uh, it's a model dependent dating, of course. Uh, where it lies on the HR diagram relative to um, theoretical models of pre-main sequence evolution, that's another way to age date the star. Uh, and you'll hear even more of them in, in today's talks. But the thing to emphasize over and over is these age dates are really approximate. You know, factors of two are, are lucky if you can do that well. There is hope that through the, a technique called asteroseismology, measuring the vibration modes of stars through precise photometric monitoring, this is something that Kepler has done on some stars, the, the ESA Plato mission will do it. Uh, that provides an, uh, maybe the best way of age dating the star by understanding what its internal structure is. Uh, but we do not have those kind of measurements for most of the young stars that we're talking about in the planet forming epoch and right after. Great, thank you. The, the question was actually about age tracer for planets, but you kind of answered it. The age tracer for planets is the age tracer for the stars they're around. So yes, of course. It yes. comes to the same thing. Okay, thank you so much, Carl. That was a great introduction. And we are now ready to move on to um, our next